And so, you know, really this title, Meeting the Moment with Paine, is not only about that pause or presence so that we can, you know, actually bring compassion into the moment, which is really important because awareness and compassion are the two wings of mindfulness. They're completely interdependent. But it is also because the starting point for meeting that moment with kindness is actually our own self-compassion. And it's the hardest thing to learn. It's actually something we have to relearn because in our society, we're not born with, or we're not, we're maybe born with it, but we're not raised with the idea that you get to be compassionate. Welcome, everyone, to the Spiritual Forum. I'm so glad you're here. It is Groundhog Day, the day we're recording. This won't air for probably another month or so, but this is one of my favorite days. My favorite movie is Groundhog Day, where you wake up on a new day and you can choose your day, you can choose your reality, you can choose what consciousness you want to live into. That's the moral of that movie, that story. So happy Groundhog Day. And I just want to send a shout out to Marianne for being a regular donor. Very much appreciate my donors. This at this point is a 100% donation-based podcast, and it is part of the Spiritual Forum Podcast Prayer and Retreat Ministry. Let me introduce you to my guest today. She is Sue Schneider. She's a PhD in medical anthropology. So she's a medical anthropologist, integrative health coach, certified mindfulness instructor, and author. She leads community health and wellness initiatives as an extension professor and state health specialist with Colorado State University's Office of Engagement and Extension. Sue is the author of Meeting the Moment with Kindness, How Mindfulness Can Help Us Find Calm, Stability, and an Open Heart. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about mindfulness and compassion and self-compassion. Welcome, Sue. Thank you so much for having me. Happy Groundhog, it, Groundhog yeah. Day. Yeah, it's it's my special day. <laughs> uh, I watched that movie like the character in Groundhog Day. He wakes up day after day after day. I'll watch that movie over and over again. I know. I've seen it 10 times. I love it as well. It's a really spiritual movie. In fact, I should do a whole it podcast is. on Groundhog Day. I mean, there's so many, there's so many, so much symbolism in the movie that people just, they think it's a movie about Bill Murray and Ha Ha and the Groundhog. There's so much spiritual messaging in that. It's pretty phenomenal. So, okay. So I want to start with asking you to just tell us a story of how you got from being a medical anthropologist, which to be honest, I don't know what that is. So perhaps you can share that with me. And then how do you get from that to becoming a certified mindfulness instructor and, and writing a book about mindfulness? Yeah, well... I love sharing information on what medical anthropology is because few people run into medical anthropologists. But anthropology is the study of cultures, of how humans behave and how humans live. And medical anthropology is kind of an arm of that that really looks at health and healing across cultures. How do different cultural groups do health and how do they bring their traditional practices into their healing modalities? It's a fascinating topic because of the globalization of medicine across cultures, of healing traditions across cultures. And we can see that in our own Western culture with all of the different modalities that we actually have access to now. So I've been fascinated with cross-cultural health and healing for a really long time, which is, you know, a really beautiful connection with things like mindfulness, with practices that are you know, ancient and bring about tools, you know, technologies and tools for healing. But what happened to me and really where that direct link is with the whole mindfulness thing was I was a young anthropologist spending a year in Mexico. I had a Fulbright fellowship. I was doing my dissertation research with a group of women who were doing grassroots health organizing. They were actually bringing a lot of different practices into community clinics in a small town. And so I was living there, observing, you know, spending time with them, documenting their work. And it just so happened that one of the women 
brought an American woman to the community center that they were working in, who was in Mexico that summer teaching meditation. And she offered the group of women that were the health promoters there the chance to spend a week doing a retreat and doing meditation practices. And at the time, I, my first reaction was like, oh, I do not have time for this. You know, I need to focus on my research. No way. Seven days of, of meditating. And I was, you know, I was really anxious and I was a perfectionist and I was overwhelmed being there and trying to accomplish this big task and recognizing that anxiety within me and experiencing, I gave in, of course, I, I experienced that seven day retreat. I had the most profound transformational experience of learning that I actually could do something about settling my nervous system, that there was a powerful, profound reaction I had when I actually focused on my breath, when I sat, I felt this sense of quiet that I hadn't been able to tap into in my life ever before. And that retreat time really changed me. I went back after that year in Mexico and I settled back in and I was writing my dissertation, but I joined a, a mindfulness group, a meditation group. We met every single week. We started reading some really amazing authors um, and I settled into a practice. And from that point on, it just was part of my life. It was, I found a way to integrate it into my work. I, I teach a lot of mindfulness now in my current work. I am an anthropologist and I do a lot of community health work, and I get to bring these teachings into the community, into new spaces, people who have never been exposed to these ideas. So it's been an amazing journey, really fun and really important and deeply personal. It's been my personal practice for 20 years, but I've been able to, to share it with others. Yeah, 20 years is a long time. <laughs> So I'm yeah. really curious, can, uh, can you help us understand, like, how do you define mindfulness? Like, what is it and, and what isn't it? Because I think people make a lot of assumptions about it. Like, I can't do that. Like you did in the beginning, you know, I can't do that. I'm too busy. Or my mind chatters too much. Or that's just not for me. And, and I think people have blocks because they think it's something different than what perhaps it is. Yeah, Totally. I mean, at the simplest level, it's just present moment awareness, present moment awareness. And it's, I think about like just putting a pair of glasses outside of your head and just letting that pair of glasses look in. What's happening? What's coming up? What are the thoughts? What are the emotions that are coming up? We just don't take the time to bring awareness to whatever is happening in our daily lives. And yes, there are a lot of assumptions out there because I think a lot of people think this is like not my culture. These are practices that are not things that I can access because a lot of people don't get, get access to concrete instruction on how to anchor in the breath, on how to anchor in the body, on how to bring awareness to the chattering mind. And in our busy, busy culture, as you know very well, it's really hard to stop and slow down. It's really hard to make a commitment to sitting for 10 minutes a day and bringing awareness to whatever is arising. There's also just these ideas that, you know, there's chanting involved and, and somehow this doesn't integrate with a faith or a religion that someone may adhere to, that they're somehow incompatible. But that is absolutely not true because mindfulness is a set of strategies that we can bring into our daily life that include attitudes, attitudes like we can take a beginner's mind. Every moment, every new moment, we can use beginner's mind and see something new. Acceptance. In this moment, whatever is coming up, we don't have to fight against a difficult feeling or even finding that I have monkey mind. You know, trust, trust in our bodies, trust in our inherent wisdom. There are so many attitudes that we can apply in our everyday lives that 
are health giving and life giving help us really get closer to the present moment more often, which is, you know, really an amazing aspect of what can happen when we practice more and more. And it's not mutually exclusive with any kind of faith or belief system. These are these are ancient practices that we can apply in different ways in our lives. Yeah, I think this idea that it contradicts a belief system or a faith is really way off because <laughs> truthfully, I mean, I will bring in my own beliefs. I, I think I, if, if you want to experience God, if you want to experience the divine source energy, the great mystery, divine intelligence, whatever name for it it is, it's in the present moment. <laughs> that's that's where it is. So the idea that we don't have time for it, but we have a belief system, it's it's very contradictory. And I know that all of the great masters, Jesus, Buddha, Lao Tzu, in any of the great masters, you know they practiced mindfulness. They were probably living in a state of mindfulness. And that's probably why they were so attractive to people and why their teachings were so worth following because, you know, they had this high consciousness and that comes from right. being being in the present moment. So it's really our key yeah. to experiencing our faith if you have a faith. So it is. It, it doesn't just I, go I, along. I, I, I think it's it. More. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And 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 accessing presence, you know, the the gateway to presence is our body, is our breath. We forget that that we have this body and it can ground us and move, you know, us from this busyness in the mind, but into the present state. And it's there and available and accessible. And it's the, it's the gateway to present. Yeah, it's interesting, though. I know for myself, I watch myself during the day. I watch myself in the morning because the morning is the time where I set aside my time to, to sit in the presence. But I, I, I watch the whole thing, the whole show, the whole show of well, maybe I should unload the dishes or maybe, you know, I got to go check on this or, oh, the cats are that. I mean, so there's the chatter, but there's also just this, this pulling away of, well, I can skip today. You know, the, yeah. Yeah. Or, or what's, or what's going on tomorrow. So I, it's funny to watch yourself. And then even like yesterday when I was doing the dishes, I'm like, oh, I just need to think about doing the dishes. Like the act <laughs> of of being present with right the dishes and experience right. being in the the activity of washing the dishes right. versus what am I going to do next? Um, right. So let's talk right. about somebody, because you talk about in your book, these habits of mind. And I, I did find myself in these, the accelerator, the automatic pilot, and being stuck. And I think there's a stacking for many of us, which one are we in most, yeah. <laughs> but we're in all three, yeah. I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, again, the whole goal is just to bring awareness to this, but, but there's just so much of our lives we spend just speeding down the highway. We're not even aware of where we're going. We're not aware of what we're passing by. There's so much we miss when we're just in this doing, doing, doing mode. These are, these are really complicated habits because they're hardwired into our brain. They follow cultural expectations of how we're supposed to be. There's not a um, caveat in our culture that says, you know, you can accomplish things and you can take time and you can prioritize the centering and the settling, the time that you need. It's, it's not like that. It's always acceleration. And so we just get used to driving and doing this. We also get used to doing this because life is complicated if we're raising kids, if we're mm -hmm. taking care of older parents, if we're you know, enmeshed in complicated jobs that many people are, we're sometimes on survival mode. And there's a lot of fight flight that's going on and adrenaline that keeps us moving. A lot of us are really fearful if we stop and take those breaths and center, it's all going to fall apart. Or mm. suddenly I'm going to feel what I'm afraid of feeling, right? So this acceleration mentality sometimes is kind of protected, protective for us. Sometimes it's just because we're unaware and we haven't been offered permission or we haven't given ourselves permission to slow it down a little bit. So that's complicated. 
and the automatic pilot part of that is we're not even um, we're not we're just not bringing awareness into that into that whole state of mind. Um, we don't even recognize that we're doing this. We don't recognize there's an alternative. And of course, we know what it's like to just be stuck where we just don't feel like the flow is happening, that life's taking us where we want to go. And so we're just like dribbles on, you know, on those wheels. And those are never comfortable places to be, especially that, that dribble on the wheel feeling. What is powerful about these practices, if we can begin to incorporate them into our lives, is that we don't have to judge ourselves about, oh my God, what's wrong with me? I can't get to where I need to go. You know, I'm just doing this all wrong. I know better than this. Or why can't I make it happen the way I want it to happen? The definition of suffering is wanting things to be different than they are. <laughs> and that causes, right, doesn't that cause us a lot of angst? Because we are trying to move in a direction and it's not where we're going. And then we're beating ourselves up. And we want things to be different. So with mindfulness, can we drop the judgment? Can there be some allowing, some recognition, some naming? Oh, this is really difficult. Because life can be really difficult. There is such a gentle way that we can be with ourselves that we just so often miss because we don't open space to recognize that, you know, we can bring a little bit of self-compassion yeah. into the moment and we don't have to judge everything as good or bad. You know, sometimes it's just life and we have to work with that. Isn't it weird that we got here? I mean, I think, you know, you have a son. I have three daughters. And whether you have your own kids or not, we, we've all seen babies and we've all been babies. Yeah. And they're, I, they're not worried right, about... The simplicity. Exactly. No. They're not worried about planning anything and they're not worried about, no. you know, whether they're doing something right or wrong. We all started off that way. It's just so yeah. weird that here we are now yeah. stuck or accelerating or trying to avoid what our bodies feel. And when we started yeah. off, we let everyone know what our bodies felt. You know, our diapers oh. were wet. We screamed. We wanted food. We yelled. We thought something was funny. We laughed. And we were really fine yeah. with our bodies. And this whole process of growing into a, a, an adult and, and the brain that goes into growing into an adult brain, it's, it's like we, we go from freedom to slavery. To slavery. And I tell you, I, I will say the 20 years I spent working on some of these things through my mindfulness practice is like working my way back, you know, into that state where I can be open and I can simply be curious. Yeah. And mentioning the body is so important because, God, I mean, we, we are almost taught to ignore our bodies, to ignore the sensation, and more importantly, to ignore the wisdom. That inherent mm. wisdom that we have within us gets completely blocked by all the doing and by all the, you know, the expectations and the judgments, right? And, and you know, one of the amazing things, I mean, we, we could focus a lot on mindfulness of the body and just noticing the sensation, what's coming up through the belly, you know, the, the triggering sensations in the belly or the heart where the tension is. And instead of rejecting all of that, because it can be scary to like really pay attention, but instead of rejecting all of that, what if we brought curiosity to it? What mm -hmm. is... What do I need to know? What do I need to stop doing? What do I need to do to take a better care of myself? That, that's the space where when we become spacious like that, that's where the inner wisdom can come out and help to guide us. We act like we don't have the capacity for guidance. It's that we're blocking a lot of the time. And this isn't blame. This is part of our human condition. This is the way we evolve to protect ourselves to keep us safe when we're in the savannah getting hunted down by <laughs> tigers. We had to, you know, really rely on that negativity bias and the, you know, the, the, the fight or flight that we have adopted and, and the amygdala that we have learned to listen to that, that warns us about staying in safe places. 
I think this relates a lot to the stress in our society. And the problem is that we don't have access, a lot of us, to that off button, to the, you know, believing that the stress is real, that believing that we can't find a way to calm the nervous system down. We might end up at high levels of stress and then respond to the stress in unhealthy ways. We all know the unhealthy ways we can respond to stress because instead of like being chased by a tiger outside of us, that tiger is in us. It's the, I must do this. I'm not good enough. I'm fearful of, you know, failing, whatever those inner tigers are. And it just continues to, to keep us ramped up and, and moving in, in directions that may not be serving us. Yeah. I mean, the stress is, is, is really caused by our thoughts. <laughs> about things yeah. more so than yeah. even what's happening. It's our thoughts about what's happening. Yeah. But I think there's also just a real disconnect. I've, I've noticed this with people that I've worked with over the years as well, and myself too, I'll put myself in there. But I think we're very disconnected with what we're actually feeling now. I mean, to actually yeah. ask somebody, what are you feeling? And, and sometimes you just got to, uh, what am I feeling? I've, I've got to pause and discern what am I feeling now? Am I feeling sad? Am I feeling mad? I, I think we just have this kind of reactivity that happens and we can't even sometimes pinpoint that feeling because you can't even feel that feeling and be present with it if you have no idea what is there. Absolutely. And I think, again, a lot of it is fear. A lot of it is fear that unless we really take steps to open up that space and learn how to experience feeling non-judgmentally and even learn to potentially befriend them. Feeling scare us in this society. What do I do with my anger? What do I do with my rage? What do I do with my grief? I've also noticed that just because of the pace of our society, we don't have time to process and digest. And I hear this from a lot of people. I hear this all the time in, in my coaching sessions. Things happen, you know, three, four, six years ago. And it's only through a session where we can just enter some quiet and explore what it feels like to settle that some of these things that have not been processed are coming up and playing out in different ways. This is a cultural reaction to the speed of our society and really, I think, how we even, even talk about and, you know, the beliefs we have around emotions and what we're supposed to do with them. Yeah, the fear is interesting to think about. I think about dreams. I, I don't personally have dreams where I'm chased or there's some, some big ominous thing there. I have very, very few of those. I have, I have dreams with kittens in them. <laughs> I love my kitten <laughs> dreams. But I, I know people who have something chasing them, and it has happened to me in a couple dreams, but I often wonder if that isn't that inner tiger. That's that, the, it's the feeling that's, that you just have to turn around and, and look at it and face it in your dream, and then it just kind of dissipates. That, that is, it's such a huge lesson right there, because how many of us instinctively think, oh, rather than running and trying to get safe, I'm going to turn around and face that. It's interesting because I recently had two dreams, two mornings in a row about a lion that was situated in my house and my family was scattered like with doors shut to stay safe. The second night that I had that dream, there was a voice that came to me and said, why did you ask? Like, I was scared. I didn't know what to do. I thought, when is this lion going to go? Like, when are we going to be safe? But there was a voice that said, why don't you ask the lion what it needs? Yes. And so I asked the lion and the lion said, I'm hungry. I need to be fed. Oh, wow. So I brought the food outside and fed the lion and my family could open the doors and be free. And I, you know, this is a lesson that I try to impart all the time about how do we listen to ourselves and face whatever it is that we're afraid of that confronts us. I have never been in a position where I actually got to see what happened. And I was surprised by that whole thing. That's really interesting. And just, just yeah. to cycle back to my kitten dreams, my, 
my kitten dreams are sometimes really happy, but sometimes I'm just overwhelmed with how many kittens there are. There are kittens <sighs> everywhere and they're all adorable, but they all need something, you know, so that's the way my psyche is <laughs> telling that's me how, it, to, right? how to face that. What do I have so, to do? <laughs> yeah. Or I can't help them all. I think it really can't comes down to, I can't help them all. And I have to find my peace with that. And I think we'll get to that in a few minutes when we talk about freeing our compassion energy, because that, that is a, a, a challenge for people who are trying to make a difference, how to, how to be able to walk through, there's a lot of stuff to fix here and I can't fix it all. And how can I be at peace with that? But I'm going to put that on a sidebar for a moment because I want to cover a few more things. I want to yeah. talk about the, the mind states because that's another thing that I had just kind of enjoyed watching myself, the controlling mind, the distracted mind, the judging mind, and the future happiness mind. And I find myself in every single one of those, you know, guilty as charged. And I, <laughs> but I think it's- You're not I think alone. I'm, I'm not alone. And I, I think that even people who've been practicing mindfulness for years, I mean, I, do, are you immune to this? Oh, no. Oh, gosh. There's nothing that I have written about that I am not actively working with. No, these are habits of mind. And they, you know, they come up through familial traditions, familial upbringing. They come up through cultural upbringing. We are profoundly uncomfortable with things being out of our control. Some of us more so than others. Some of us have a little bit you know, more capacity to relax into that feeling of, of groundlessness and discomfort. But that controlling mind, it's, it's a powerful one. And it's worthy of recognizing when it comes up. And it's worthy of, you know, just bringing some acceptance to it rather, again, than like, oh, how dare I bring that controlling self out? It's like, well, what is going on that I need to hold tight and be tense in this moment and try to you know, fix or make sure things are in the place I want them to be. What exactly is going on? What, what is my discomfort? And so taking that moment and trying to get under what's driving the controlling mind is pretty powerful. And it, you keep mentioning that you're, you're able to see these things kind of flowing through. And that is absolutely a result of your practice, just being able to have that awareness, the fact that, you know, we are, we are just human beings that are going to have these states of mind constantly flowing through us. The difference, if we can apply mindfulness, is that we recognize it and we become aware. And so rather than my controlling nature, which is a huge thing that I've been working on all my life, but rather than that coming out in, you know, a relationship issue, for example, you know, striking out of my husband, because I feel out of control. I am able to see myself getting triggered. And if I can kind of step in before I move from the triggering point to the action point, then I'm going to be in a much better place. I'm not going to do something I regret, right? So there's the recognizing I have these habits, but, you know, and that's different from letting the habits become actions, which is, I think, where people can get into a lot of trouble. I think the distracted mind is, is so pernicious in our society. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we've been helped by our phones, by our technology, mm -hmm. by all of the social media craziness. And I really, and I know there's a lot of research out there about how all of these electronics are actually changing our brains. And you can see this mostly in kids who are being raised on their devices. Distracted mind is a real thing and it's getting hardwired in our brains. And I think that's why I feel really a sense of urgency with this. You know, I, my husband and I, my husband's a mindfulness instructor as well. And so mindfulness is really important to both of us. And we ensure that we both go on silent meditation retreats whenever we can. It may be once a year, it may be four times a year, whenever we can, because there is nothing like stepping back from everything. There is nothing like handing over your phone and your tablet for two days, five days, eight days to reset. And when we reset, we can feel 
how much clarity we can access without all that jumble and junk. And it is just so hard to be able to do that, you know, on a daily basis. We need to do a little bit of it on a daily basis at least. But that distracted mind is is definitely a challenge. And again, when we feel that frenzy going on, can we put those glasses on on the outside and just take a look in? Like, what is, what am I avoiding? What am I not wanting to feel? What am I not wanting to experience right now? And then the judging mind. Oh my goodness, right? How do we turn on our cell? You know, whenever a discomfort arises, people either begin judging themselves or they push that judgment outward. And I'm sure people can relate to one or the other. It's kind of the central way we react. And again, how do we even just recognize, ah, there's that judging part of me coming up. Nothing wrong with me. It's okay. You know, bringing a little compassion, but we don't have to follow through with, you know, the words coming out of our mouths that we are thinking. There's so many ways to work with all of that. And then the future happiness mind. Ugh, it's like this idea of if only, when, when I get that next job, when I meet that next partner, when I finally get to retire, only then will I be able to access what I really want. And oh my gosh, can we mess our entire lives in that mentality without recognizing? Guess what? There is this moment, this precious moment, and we can harness whatever we need in that moment. And I'm not saying any of this is easy at all. I don't know anyone who's mastered this, but I do think they're kind of North Stars to follow that we can maybe try to do a few things differently. It's the way we relate to our experiences rather than from our experiences. How are we relating to our experiences that can make a difference rather than reacting to our experiences? Yes, yeah. So can you share, like you mentioned that you and your husband both make sure that you each go on some sort of mindfulness retreat, at least annually. So that's the practice you have. What, what are other practices that you have since you've been doing mindfulness for 20 years? Yeah. Well, we have a meditation group of two in our household. Every night before we go to bed, we practice together. So we just set the timer for 25 minutes and we'll sit, you know, We'll sit together, but we're not, you know, of course, interacting. It is consistent. We do that when we're on vacation. We do that when we're at home. Our son has grown up knowing that's what happened before bed. And he respects that. And it's really important to us. I, you know, started trying to do morning practices, midday practices. It, the only thing that works for me, and this is very much my situation. Everyone needs to find their space. But for me, it, it, it had to be at the end of the at the end of the day. So we do that together. And before we eat a meal, and this was actually Aiden, our son's um, idea a couple of years ago, he suggested we take three deep breaths before we pick up our forks and start to eat. So every night, you know, we sit down and we breathe together. And it's simple. It's simple. But it it centers us and it makes us, you know, recognize our gratitude. Just we're together, we have a meal, and we're going to settle, and this is what we're doing right now. Those are some things. We, my husband and I started a meditation group here. There, there are a lot of ways that this just comes into our lives, but, and I will say the retreats are the most profound. I, 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 I reckon retreats are not easy to do. We're at a point in our lives where you know, one person can certainly take care of our sons. It it wouldn't have happened and it didn't happen when our son was much younger, but it has become a lifesaver for us. In fact, the last time my husband went on retreat, he was experiencing acute burnout. He's a psychotherapist and he recognized the burnout. We were talking about it. What do we do? You know, how are you going to do? It was the worst he's ever experienced. And we realize, okay, it's time for you to, to go on retreat. And it, you would not believe the difference. He came back. He had a different perspective. He was ready to go back in there. And we've just seen a lot of benefits of taking time out. That's all it is. It's just 
formal pauses. We all need those. Yeah. Yeah. I love the three breaths before mealtime. I mean, all of it is great, but the three breaths before mealtime is something that anyone can do anywhere before they pick up that fork. And it's like having a, an alarm go off. And, oh, before I pick up my fork, I'm going to breathe three times, center myself yeah. on what I am doing. And, and I suppose you could even get yourself to do that before any activity. You know, like I was talking about doing the dishes yeah. last night. Before I do the dishes, I take three breaths. Now I do the dishes. So that's, that's a take-home that. one for everybody who's listening, I love plus everything that. else. Yeah. 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 In your book, you have a, a story you tell about Aiden, your son, going to a camp. And they didn't have the organized activities. And can you share that a little bit? I thought that was so cool because I think about, so you, you and your husband both practice mindfulness and what a cool set of parents you are. I'm thinking, wow, there aren't that many kids who have parents that practice mindfulness. And every night <laughs> you, you see them, you know, sit down together and practice yeah. mindfulness. You know, that's just not how kid, most kids are raised. So I'm thinking about just kind of questioning what else did you do with your child to to raise him in mindfulness and i know the story of the kind of the camp came up but whatever else you have to share yeah. about that would be helpful too oh it, it has been such a journey and i've learned so much it's one thing to say you should you know inculcate your kid with all of these you know principles and practices it's another thing to support your kid where they are for sure <laughs> Yeah. So the camp a couple of years ago, it was a family camp. It was in the mountains. It was like six days. And it it was profound without any kind of electronics. And it was just kids connecting with each other and watching them make up games. I think Aiden was maybe 11, 10 or 11 at that point, watching them just make up games and feeling the freedom. It is so rare that you feel the kids freedom these days even they get together with friends and they play sports and they do their thing but out in nature that the most sophisticated thing in front of them is a rock or a tree and they find their way to creating a hide and seek game using nature um it was incredibly profound and and there were this was a mindfulness camp of course and so there were great teachings and I share in the book about how one morning, you know, Aiden woke up super grumpy and I, my reaction to that is always, you know, the self-flogging, like, oh, what did I do that I have this unappreciative kid? Here we are at camp and why is he so grumpy? And we have this full day in front of us. And I, I really took that one hard and we sat down in a group and there was a teacher kind of getting us started for the day. We did a mini meditation and she, then she was like, she said, she looked around the group and she said, raise your hand if anyone in here is grumpy. And all of these hands went up, including mine, of course, because I was grumpy at that point. And she just said, hmm, maybe it's okay if we're grumpy today. And all of a sudden the air was just released. You know, the hot air was just released out of the room and everyone kind of relaxed because it was like they were accepted for whatever they brought in that moment. And that really, of course, turned things around in that moment. And it just it's it's a constant reminder for me of like, this is what kids do. They go through challenging emotional states and can we breathe into them and like normalize that? That's what we all do. But it's it's not easy, of course, raising a kid. And, and I'll say, you know, we recently put Aiden through, there was a research study out of Colorado State where I work for teenagers and stress and mindfulness. And so we enrolled him in that research study. And it was, I think it was a six-week program. He grumbled and grunted, you know, mm, I'm going to this thing, I'm going to this thing. But at the end, of course, every week we're like, how was it? What did you learn? And we, we would get no information. And at the end, it was this kind of interesting, profound, you know, I really feel like I can make myself feel better kind of thing. We understood he had, something had settled in to him. And I feel like it's little by little. It's the things he'll accept doing around mindfulness that we can't push him into Whatever he accepts doing, he gets something. It may not be what we want. He's not going to be a meditator. He doesn't want to join us at night. 
little by little. He did get an Apple Watch, and he's actually now doing the breathing technique with the Apple Watch, which I find quite interesting. Nothing we would have encouraged him to do, but maybe a natural response to just understanding inherently maybe there's something good that could come from that. It's been a fascinating journey, and I'm sure it will continue. Yeah, I'm sure too. I mean, he he will find his way. I have to say that when you told that story about the grumpiness and being in a circle and who all is grumpy, my mind went to how cool it would be if that's how we started meetings like in corporations. I had a, I had a corporate career before I started this, this ministry and this podcast. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if in the beginning of the meeting, we just kind of like settle into our feelings? <laughs> What are we bringing into Imagine. this meeting? I know. And I know. What if we acknowledged our feelings? Like, right. I mean, we have businesses and companies and organizations that they work completely devoid of feelings. Feelings aren't even allowed in that. Right, state. right. Imagine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Who all feels grumpy today? All the hands <laughs> would go up. I'm grumpy. I hate meetings. <laughs> Let's just be with hating meetings for a moment. I think that uh, would completely shift the meeting. It would totally would. Okay. All right. So now I want to shift to this feeling our compassion energy because I think this is this is the heart of it for me uh, because, I mean, freeing our compassion energy because, you know, when, when mo most of us look out into the world and we go, it's a mess <laughs> or something's not yes. right and or our 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 compassion goes out to animals, people, traffic children, abused women, whatever, whatever it is. A lot of people are in action or want to be in action to help, to be of service. And yet it's just so overwhelming sometimes. And I think that this whole mindfulness thing can be very helpful to help us navigate holding the current state of the world while you're also holding the vision for wanting it to be different. So I, I kind of like to shift the conversation to that and let you take it away. I did love the start of that chapter where you talk about the definition of happiness is a wideness of heart, wideness of heart, that that's an ancient yeah. Egyptian definition. I thought that was lovely, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, unhappiness yeah. is a truncated or alienated heart. Yeah, that really puts happiness in perspective you know, for what it really is. Of heart. Yeah, you could define mindfulness as heartfulness because yes. it means we're connected with our heart, right? Which is the opposite of being alienated from ourselves. And people may not recognize that the source of social isolation and the alienation we're experiencing culturally, is rooted in our own self-alienation. And that, to me, is the link here because what we're talking about when we're freeing our compassion energy, it means we have to be connected to ourselves. We have to do the inner work to build that self-connection and trust. Again, only when we do that and we have that connection to our heart, I'm going to just keep coming back to the heart because this is, we do not talk about this in our culture and we do not recognize the power that we hold right here. When we are connected internally to ourselves, we are so powerful externally. That is the source of our service. That is the source of our power. And it's hard to watch everything that's happening in the world right now, it is hard to observe without wanting to step in and fix and change. And yet, if we haven't done this inner work and found our own stability, we are just not going to be as effective as we could be doing that outer work. In fact, there's a quote I love to read that just to me, it, this really kind of summarizes the reality of this. This is by Yangi Minger Rinpoche, who writes, until we transform ourselves, we are like mobs of angry people screaming for peace mm -hmm. in order to move the world 
we must be able to stand still in it. And I mean, I started out, you know, even before I became an anthropologist, I was a VISTA volunteer. I worked at a nonprofit. I, you know, I took it really seriously as soon as I got out of college. Service, service, service. That was my motto without even recognizing myself in that work. I didn't matter. I wasn't in there. And it has taken me years and years of practice to recognize how much more I can accomplish when I am factored in to the service that I am doing. And so, you know, really this title, Meeting the Moment with Kindness, is not only about that pause or presence so that we can, you know, actually bring compassion into the moment, which is really important because awareness and compassion are the two wings of mindfulness. They're completely interdependent. But it is also because the starting point for meeting that moment with kindness is actually our own self-compassion. And it's the hardest thing to learn. It's actually something we have to relearn because in our society, we're not born with, or we're not, we're maybe born with it, but we're not raised with the idea that you get to be compassionate towards yourself. I, when I teach about freeing the compassion energy, I often teach a loving kindness practice, which is a, it's an ancient traditional practice. You use a series of phrases like, may I be well, may I be at, may I be free from suffering. And repeating those phrases, first, potentially for yourself, then for someone else. You can expand, widen the circle to other people. You can even practice it for people you have struggles with, you know, potential difficult people in your lives. And whenever I teach this practice, 100% of the time, people say, what was most difficult for me was wishing myself well. I had no problem wishing the other well. I was kind of struggling with wishing the difficult person well. But boy, that was hard to wish myself well. And that is exactly the point of the practice. I think about it as like water running over the stone. It takes a long time, but over the years, it softens that stone. Those phrases or, and I keep putting my hand on my heart because for me, it's very visceral. It's a reminder. It's a somatic experience. Again and again to repeat phrases, to remember that care that I need to give to myself is just so vital. And for me, that's the key to really trying to affect change and then recognizing that we have to work within our own purview, you know, and not get discouraged. I mean, I think that is really important for anybody who's an activist or an activate um, advocate or Anybody who's in service, I think you also mentioned that like selfless service, that term is is like giving up the self in order to serve everybody else. And that just doesn't work. You know, we have to, we have to accept our own compassion and not deflect it. I can, I can just see that people would kind of put up a deflector. So if we look out in the world and we're unhappy with it, or we want it to be better, or we want people to suffer less, or we have, you know, our heart goes out to whatever group is, is not, not equitably treated, that we have to find peace, equanimity, and compassion within ourselves first. And our practice helps us to tend to the heart, the ultimate source of connection and compassion. So this is really essential. And I think that I just want to kind of drill that, that down because I think that so many people with caring hearts just burn out. They get sick. They drown in sorrow. I'm in the animal rights community, and there's just so much burnout there and just so much drowning our sorrows and feeling the suffering of all the animals. And there's another thing you talk about, about distinct, distinguishing between empathy and compassion. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I thought that was also key. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, empathy is a wonderful thing. It means I care about you. I feel what you're feeling. It's like getting down on someone's level and looking at, looking at them in the eyes and saying, I feel what you're feeling. I'm here for you. Compassion ex- 
extends that out and it says, I want you to be well. It takes one more step. I want you to be well. Now, it doesn't mean that we take the step of fixing the problem per se. It can be, as I would just mentioned, reciting those phrases to ourselves quietly. May you be well. May you be free of suffering. That can be an action we can take if that is as far as we can go. If we are not in a position to walk hand in hand with that person or if it's not safe. In many cases, we care about people and it's not safe for us to do that or if it's not physically possible, but that we are wishing them well and that through our choice to move that energy of compassion outward, we can actually make a difference. And I think that's a hidden thing that people don't recognize, even if you cannot fix someone or you're not going to fix someone, if you cannot be you know, present and, you know, really help someone solve a problem, compassion can still happen through your wishes for people to be well. What kind of energy are you putting out in the world? You know, our thoughts are so powerful. You said this before. They have the power to create. They have the power to destroy. Can we use our thoughts for the power of compassion? That, to me, is energetic change. And it's step one, of course. We, of course, need to be out there advocating when we are ready and and strong and centered to do that. But we can also just send people compassion and hold that compassion for them in our hearts. It can be really powerful. Yeah, I mean, we're energetic beings. I think we forget that. You know, I mean, we can do everything energetically. (laughs) Absolutely. We're living in this clunky world where we think that we have to be there or we have to say the right thing or whatever. But yeah, once we get our power, once we understand our power, the inner power that we have, and also the fact that we're all energy and that we can interconnect and communicate that way and and send our energy that way and receive that way as well, you know, who knows what the world would look like? Who knows what the world would look like? That is exactly the point. And I mean, I just You know, I'm so grateful for opportunities like this to be able to just have these conversations. I taught to a class yesterday of over 60 older adults who were just, they were so curious and they were so, you know, had so many questions about this and these opportunities to just explore, you know, this is a fundamental mind shift that we all can make in how we're relating to the world. And how we're relating to ourselves and how we're sending, you know, care and compassion outward. And sometimes it's just like the awareness of that. I didn't even know that was possible. And that is why, you know, undoing some assumptions about mindfulness is so important. I just, I don't think we've done a good job in our culture to make these teachings really accessible and really helping people understand what the impacts are. Because people could easily say, you know, I don't have time to meditate. This stuff feels a little bit proofy to me. I don't really understand why anyways. What's going to happen? You know, maybe I'll have a little more peace in my life or clear my mind a little bit, but but what's the big deal? But what else are we going to do right now, you know, unless we are working on this studying process and unless we are opening our hearts outward, where else are we going to start to make a difference in this complicated That is at least my perspective. Yeah, and I think if for me, if I remember that when I am present in the present moment, when I do have this open heart, I am letting the divine in. I am having the experience of the divine. And I've often imagined that at the end of our lives, you know, let's just say we live till we're 95, but you know, how How many moments did we spend present? Well, certainly the first years of our life when we're children. And then probably the next 94 years, we might have spent maybe another year (laughs) at most present. So we're really only two. (laughs) Two years of our lives, right? Right. Mm. And, and, And the question I get the most when I teach, and I teach a lot to older adults, is, is it too late to change my brain? Is it too late? And of course, it's not too late. And neuroscience has been wonderful. Research has really shown us how valuable our brains are. But absolutely, why why wait another day 
to try to spend another minute, another hour, another day really cultivating presence. We, we can't wait. Yeah, I'm thinking that we do this in preschool, and I'm thinking that we do this in senior centers and, you know, the, the nursing homes. Perhaps, perhaps. But those, you know, the, the distracted brain and the, you know, contracted brain are, are so hardwired as we get older. And so it, it actually is, is pretty complicated when we've had a lifetime of, of really, you know, solidifying these habits yeah. in mind. Yeah. I'm just thinking as you get closer to the end of life, it's, it's like the wall is staring at you and keeps coming closer. It's like, okay, yes. you know, what is my life really about? And that perhaps right. there are some people that as it gets closer, they start to realize, oh, my gosh, I want to be alive in a new way. Yeah. And when we can reflect and make that recognition, absolutely. I am actually part of a book club right now. We're reading Stephen Levine's A Year to Live. And so we're giving ourselves a year to do a practice of what is it like. And of course, we don't want to have this true, real experience, but we're taking steps to work through the life reevaluation. I'm 50 years old. It's a really good time, honestly, for me to do that right right there in the middle. And really, really powerful to take the time and give myself the space to do that life reevaluation. And it's never too early to start that. And it's very, it's very grounding, actually, and centering to be present with what this life is and, and what it has to offer. That sounds like a great book for a book group. Yeah. Okay. We're, we just got a couple more minutes. So I want to make sure that if there's something that I didn't cover or something that you want to say that uh, we didn't get to, this is your chance. Oh, this has been wonderful. We've gotten to so many important topics. I guess just to reiterate mindfulness, it just helps us widen our lens. It helps us get perspective. So if anything, and there are tools and technologies just, you know, one breath here, one practice here to be able to widen the lens and see that we are the sky. We are, you know, we, we are spacious beings. We have the capacity to have that perspective and operate from that perspective. You know, I just, I hope that these topics resonated with your listeners and, you know, in, in the book, every single chapter has a practice. And they're cumulative, so really simple practices just to start working with anchors. And those practices are designed to, to be able to build on each other and become a regular practice. And that's what I, I hope for people, just that they can experiment with what it's like to slow down, pause, and take a look. I love it. I love that we are the sky. I think that's a wonderful message to end on. Listeners out there, you are the sky. I love that. You're the sky. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sue, for sharing all about your book, your experience, your life, about mindfulness. I think this has been a really fun conversation. And I know that you've blessed those who are listening today. Thank you so much for, for having me. And, and this has just been such a wonderful conversation. I appreciate it. I think so, too. So. I'm going to close now. Thank you, everybody. And I now close the spiritual forum.